Good morning, church. My name is Zach, one of the pastors here. We are jumping back into our Just Like Judas series. We did a couple weeks of this, and then we took a break for Mother's Day because we thought it was best to not talk about Judas on Mother's Day. And then we did a COVID debrief last Sunday. If you missed that, check that out. It was a powerful time uh, just to process through together as a church family. So today we're jumping back in. We've already covered different characteristics of Judas, things that we see in him that if we were honest, we kind of have in ourselves and our lives too. And so we're addressing those and dealing with those hard topics. And so we talked about hypocrisy uh, and then we talked about gossip. And so we saw that Judas was a hypocrite, that he put up this front of being a follower of Jesus, but in really his heart was far from God. Uh, and then he also used gossip and triangulation uh, to get what he wanted. And so today is going to be, I think, one of the more obvious uh, negative characteristics of Judas that we're going to talk about, and it's greed, that Judas was greedy. In Matthew 26, it records uh, when Judas went to get money to betray Jesus, uh, and this is what it says in Matthew 26, then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him, Jesus, over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And so it's really interesting, as I kind of looked at this week with fresh eyes, uh, you see that Judas went to the chief priests, to the religious leaders that hated Jesus. He went to them and said, what will you give me if I hand him over to you? So he sought it out. He was greedy. He wanted money for it. He wasn't tempted. They didn't recruit him into this business. But he went to them and said, what will you give me if I hand Jesus over to you? And so I was curious, how much money is 30 pieces of silver in today's world? Well, it's actually really debated because it depends on how big the silver coins were that he got, whether they were the Jewish ones or the Roman ones, but it's anywhere from $200 to $4,000 today. So for a couple hundred bucks or maybe a couple thousand, Judas betrayed Jesus to death for just a little bit of money. He turned his back on him. And what's also interesting about that value, that number of coins is that in the ancient world, that was the standard value of a slave. It's 30 pieces of silver. That was the going rate, or if something happened to one, that's what they would pay, 30 pieces of silver. So it was highly symbolic and insulting that they paid him 30 pieces of silver for Jesus. And so Judas was greedy. We see that. He wanted money, and he did something terrible. And greed is not something that we like in our culture, in our day, when we see it, we, we don't praise it, we don't go, good job, you're really greedy, love that about you, right? Like, it's not a good characteristic that we see in other people. And it's kind of this, like, obvious bad thing that we'll see in people on the news, or different businessmen that go too far, or whatever, and we say they're just greedy. But we would maybe say, well, I'm not, though. I'm just ambitious in life. I'm just building my, my home, my, my little, my nugget. My, my family, right? And we would disconnect ourselves from that. But I'll be honest and I'll give you a warning. I think as we look at this today, that we have a lot more of a, what I'll call a passive greed in our life than the real active, nasty looking greed that we see on the news. But if we evaluate ourselves, and that's what I'm going to encourage us to do today, I think we have a lot more greed that we need to deal with. Which, by the way, greed is not a fun thing to preach on. Neither is hypocrisy that I did a month ago. I'd rather talk about like hope in Jesus and joy and all that fun stuff, but sometimes you got to wrestle through the hard ones uh, to see growth in your life and your relationship with God. So greed. Greed is a nasty thing in our culture. There's this long-standing story that I always think of when I think about greed from John D. Rockefeller. He was the big oil tycoon, big businessman in the late 1800s that built the Standard Oil Trust, this massive corporation. It was the first like, monopoly that the government had to break up. He had like 90% or so of the oil business in the country. Uh, and so there's this story. He was, the great, he was the most wealthy American, really the person in the world, the most wealthy person in the world in his day, and arguably for a long time or even today in comparison. But there was this story about a reporter that came to him and said to the richest person, how much money is enough? How much money is enough? And his response was, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. It's rather ironic from the richest, most wealthy person to say, just a little bit more. And isn't that what greed is? That we're discontent, that we just want a little bit more, that if I just had that, then I would feel content. Then I would be satisfied. Then I'd be at peace. But I don't have that, thus I don't have peace or satisfaction right now. That's what greed is. And we see that in other people, and we don't praise it, and we don't want that. But the interesting thing about Rockefeller is that he had this bad reputation because his business was so successful, and he was such a shrewd businessman. But if you study his life, he was actually a very generous person. He was a believer. He was super involved in his church. 
He retired in his 50s, and for 40 years, he did a bunch of uh, philanthropy, built up organizations, and so he was a great person, but he was, had this greedy image, much because of the tycoons of the day, and that we kind of looked down at him. And I don't think that story actually happened. I think it's more legend. But nonetheless, that's what greed is. Just a little bit more, then I'll be satisfied in life. But let's define it. Let's look to the dictionary like we did with hypocrisy and gossip. Merriam-Webster defines greed as selfish and excessive desire for more of something, such as money, than is needed. A selfish, yeah. an excessive desire for more of something, usually money, than is actually needed. And so you would say that's true. I mean, that's the dictionary definition, right? And really, that's the cultural understanding of what it means to be greedy. But I think this definition is lacking in the fact that it's presupposing a standard uh, of what is acceptable for desiring something. It's saying that it's an inappropriate, it's a too far, it's an excessive desiring of stuff. Thus, there must then be some realm of desiring things that's okay. That when you cross that, then you're greedy. But before that, you're just ambitious, you're just building, it's okay. So then I got to ask, what is that standard? What is that acceptable level of desiring things, of working towards things that's okay in our culture, according to this definition, versus what's excessive? You see how it's lacking? It doesn't fill that in. And so then you got to wonder and think about in our own lives, what are we comparing that to? What are we desiring against? How are we defining what it means to be wealthy? How many pairs of sneakers do we really need in comparison to not, right? I mean, these are the questions that I think come out of this. What is actually greedy or not? Is it the poverty line in our country, which is very, very low? The average income in Waconia, I believe, is 89 or 90,000 per household. It's the median or average income. And so we're far beyond the poverty line in our country. And that's here, and wherever you're watching from on the country of the world, you have different standards. So then maybe is it a global statistics, global standards of wealth that we would compare ourselves to to see whether we're wealthy or whether we're greedy? Well, if you do that, you'll be surprised. Because if you make $30,000 a year, just $15 an hour, you're in the top 5% of wealth in the world. $30,000 a year, top five. You can write home to your mom about that. I made it, <laughs> top 5%. If you make $75,000 a year or more, you are in the top 1% of wealth in the world. Much of the world lives on much less than we have. We are very blessed. We are very wealthy in comparison to the world. So if we compare it to that, then we need to like give everything away, right? And we're very greedy in comparison to what we have and are desiring for more when we already have so much, right? But what is the standard? What do we compare? How do we define? What does it mean to be greedy in our lives? I think very often for us then, it's other people. People around us are what they have or they don't have. And if they're desiring more and we think they already have enough, then we would call them greedy. But I don't have enough, so I'm not greedy because I need this. Right? These are the justifications and the comparisons we do to other people to create that standard of what's acceptable or not. But I got to ask then, what does God think about greed? What does God say about greed and money and how do we acquire and how do we steward what we have? Well, the Bible talks a lot about money and greed, actually. Jesus taught about it a lot, more than most topics, because he knew the hold that money would have on our hearts and in our lives and the importance of it. And so Jesus taught a lot about it. And so I want to look at the Bible and I'm going to have three facts about money and greed from the Bible. Three things that God teaches us that really can steward and shape our thinking and how we approach our finances in our life. And the first fact is this. Money is fine. Money's fine. It's morally neutral. It's not an evil thing. It's not a really good thing. It's a tool. It's just a fact, a thing of life. Money is fine. However, it is the love of money that causes all kinds of problems. The love of money. You know, there's that song, that phrase, like, more money, more problems. It's really more love of money, more problems, is a reality. You see, in the Bible, Paul addresses this when he wrote to Timothy. He was a young pastor at a church in Ephesus, dealing, from some, dealing with some issues in his church. And Paul wrote to him in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So he says, the love of money is what causes, it's the root of so much evil, so many struggles in life. It's not money itself, it's the love of it. So that means you can have no money, but be in love with money and have a lot of problems in life. And so he's writing to them, and really then at the core of it is its discontentment. 
that it's wanting more, it's loving money, this eagerness for it that he saw in the early church, this is 2,000 years ago, and we still see it today. This eagerness to build money, to build wealth, had people then wander away from God, that they were living for their money instead of living for God in their life. And they were discontent, they were not satisfied, they were chasing after money. Money is fine, but the love of it leads us away from God. And if we back up in this passage in 1 Timothy 6, Paul says more of this. He says in verse 6, For godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Notice he says those that want to get rich, not those that are rich. It's the desire, the eagerness to build that, the love of money, the build to get rich that leads people into so much harmful and foolish desires. And he starts with this kind of equation. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So godliness plus contentment equals great gain. It's a great position, a great spot to be in in life. And so godly, to, that, what that means is that you're a pious, you're a holy person, you're desiring God, uh, you live a holy life, you're pursuing God, and if you have that, plus being content, satisfied, thankful for what you have and where you're at in life, then that's a great gain. That's a good spot. But if you're missing one of those, then you won't be in a good spot with God and in your life. And so if you are godly but not content, then you won't be in a good spot. Or vice versa, if you are ungodly but somehow you're content in life, then you won't be in a good spot either. But we are called to be godly and content, and that is great gain in life. But that's hard. It's hard to be content with what we have, with everything around us tells us that we need more. That if we just had that, then we'd be content, then we'd be satisfied, then we'd feel peace and joy. But often we want more than we are given or more than we have in life. It reminds me of my daughter, Nora. So I have three beautiful, amazing, healthy children that I'm so thankful for. Selah, Judah, and Nora, they're six, four, and two. And my baby girl, Nora, uh, we have seen this quite recently and frequently with her. I guess I saw it with the other kids. But with Nora, we moved her away from a sippy cup a little too soon, like way too soon, and out of a high chair too soon because she wanted to be like her older siblings. So we're like, all right. And, and so we moved her into a normal, you know, just a normal kid cup. Doesn't have a lid on it. Way too soon. Because then it turned into everything going into her water her hand, her food, her silverware, her sister's spoon, her brother's food, right? Like everything goes into it and we're always like, stop it, get your hand out of there. And, and she's kind of like gotten past that, but what she still struggles with is spilling her water, spilling her cup, knocks it over all the time. And this is really our subtle way of keeping our table clean because it just turns, <laughs> turns into a lake. And we're just like, well, get the rag out and just wipe it up. Thanks, Nora. But constantly, she knocks over her water because she's not paying attention. She sets it half on her plate. She bumps it, whatever the reason is. And so we, you know, we've learned this, and so we don't give her a full glass of water because we realize most likely it's going to be everywhere. And so when I give her a cup of water, I give a little bit of water in it. And I've trained her that, you know, this is, here you go, Nora, and she want, always wants more. She goes, I, I want a lot of water, Dad. That's what she'll ask. Give me water. I want a lot of water. I'm like, all right, here you go. <laughs> No, I want a lot of water. Here you go. And it's this back and forth that we do. And I'm like, if you're good with that, we'll give you more. I want a lot of water. All right, well, if you drink that, honey, I'll refill it. Yeah, if you drink that, I'll refill. I'll put more water in there. And then if you drink that, I'll refill it again. And if you drink that, guess what? Daddy will refill it again. And again and again, right? Because I want her to be hydrated because I care about her. I'm a good father. But I don't trust her to give more than that. She's not mature enough yet. But isn't that us with God? That God has given us something. He's given us what he has in life. And more often, we respond with, well, I want more, God. I want a full cup. I want to be married now. But are you stewarding your singleness and where God has placed you in life? Are you treating people right now? Because if you get married, you're not going to be any different. We need to steward where we're at in life. Or maybe I want the big house now, God. But are you stewarding the apartment or wherever you are now? I want to lead a big company. I want to manage a bunch of people. Well, are you stewarding? Are you handling what God has given you now correctly and in a way that honors God? Or are you dissatisfied with it and you want more and you want the full cup now? 
We're not content. And that's what leads to so much greed in our life. Money is fine, but it's the love of it, the the dissatisfaction with what we have that leads to so much greed in our heart and in our life. The second fact is this. Your greed is the symptom of a bigger problem. Your greed is the symptom of a bigger problem. It's not the end problem within itself. There's something bigger going on. And there's a lot of sources to our greed, things that cause it welling up in our life. And I already talked about some of this discontentment and dissatisfaction within ourselves, but a lot of times we're greedy because of other people, because we're coveting what others have. Oh, they got another new boat, or they got this, or they went on this vacation. We're jealous, we're coveting, we want their stuff, and we need that then. And we're just, it's really, it's greed, it's what it is. Or we want some status, right? We want to be a manager, a director level, or we want to get some degree or whatever it is. And it's fine to work towards things, but when we're doing it just for status, then really we're being greedy. That is not ambi- ambition, it's greed. And often we're comparing, comparing ourselves to others and what they have and what we don't have. And so we're not content, we're not satisfied in life. But the thing is, those are really sources of our greed, but it's not the real big problem. There's something bigger going on underneath. And Paul talks about this in Colossians 3. This is another little letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. So this is the original church 2,000 years ago. He's addressing a problem there that still exists today. He says this in Colossians 3. It's a great chapter. If you're not familiar with it, I highly suggest you read it. And he compares things that we need to put to death and we need to stop in our life of our sinful nature and things we need to take on of our spiritual nature as we follow God. And so this is the negative stuff. He says this in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So he lists all this stuff, and we're like, yeah, that's bad. We don't want to do that. But he ends with saying greed, which is idolatry. So he's saying that greed, in essence, what it really is, the core of it, the bigger problem going on, is idolatry. It's not just dissatisfaction or being discontent. It's idolatry. And that may be some weird, churchy, biblically word that we don't understand, so let me define it. Idolatry and worship are important parts of, of, of our life that we don't always realize what's going on. You see, we were created to be in right relationship with God, to know God and to center our life around Him. And anything that we put at the center of our life that's not God is an idol. And then we worship that, that's idolatry. And so when we don't have right relationship with God, when we're worshiping other things, that's what idolatry is. And in the the biblical times, and they're still in places in the world today, they had literal idols that they made and they worshiped and they give sacrifices to. And so that's more obvious. And you're like, well, I don't have that in my life today. But we have modern versions of idols in our life. And so we were created to be in relationship with God, to worship, to live as if he's the sun and we're the planets rotating around him. We're supposed to orient, center our life around our relationship with God. That's where we were created to be in a garden, to be in relationship, to know him, to live with him. But that relationship is fractured. And so we fill it with other things if we don't know God. We put like good things, but we put other things in that spot. And worship then is really giving attention, proper attention, adoration, praise that we're supposed to give to God at the center of our life, but instead we give it to other things. So we are made to worship. We're going to worship something. And so if we don't know God, we're going to worship other things, things of this life, things of this world that we'll give adoration and attention to. And commonly we think of worship as worship music, like we started the service with, and that's a very big, like visible form of it. But worship can also happen through prayer, through giving, being generous, showing that money doesn't control your life giving your time, Bible reading, prayer and meditation. These are ways that we worship, that we turn our heart towards God at the center of our life. And if God's not there, then we'll worship other things. But we have lots of modern versions or modern tools, really, that enable us to connect with our idols and idolize things. It's not little statues in our life most commonly, but it's other things. For example, I'm going to throw some dirt. You're going to survive. All right, don't hate me. Uh, Did you know that the average American watches more than four hours of TV every day. Four hours. That's on average. It's actually older ages watch more like seven or eight, like 65 and plus. If you're like in your 20s, it's an hour and a half on average, but overall it's four hours of TV a day. That's 28 hours a week. That's almost a job watching TV. That's two months solid of watching TV a year. 
So in a 65 year, just as an average, 65 years, the average person will have spent nine years sitting on the couch watching TV. Nine years at 65 watching TV. That's absurd. And then add to that our smartphones. Yeah, I'm going there. <laughs> the average person is on their phone about three hours a day. It's two hours and 54 minutes. That's average. So some of it's a whole lot more and some of it's less. But three hours a day. That equates to this year, 2022, a month and a half on our phone. 44 days that we spent on our phone. On average, people check their phones 344 times a day. That's not just notifications. That's intentionally pulling it out and checking. Did I miss anything? Did I get that email yet? What's happened on social media, right? Like we're 344 times. That comes out to every four minutes. That's crazy. I've been talking for like, what, 20 minutes? <laughs> Checked it five times? Anyone want to admit that? No. You're like, yeah, well, if you were more interesting, I wouldn't have to check my phone. No? <laughs> See, you preach about greed. But 344 times a day. And here's the thing, here's my point. TV and our smartphones are not bad things within themselves. They're very addictive, but it's, it's what we're doing with them that shows what we're idolizing, what we're worshiping with our life. We're using things that God has given us in a way to worship things of this world instead of worshiping God. So these things are not morally evil. They're morally neutral, just like money. But we use them in a way to idolize things, celebrities, people we know, materials and stuff, and we call it like, well, I need this. But really, it's just this underlying greed in our life, and we're addicted to it. So for example, the number of TV commercials that we see is overwhelming. Again, because of this four hours of TV. And so the, our habitual use of technology is creating this passive greed in us because we're constantly told that we don't have enough. And I'm not hating on marketing. It's fine. I like marketing. It's good stuff. But the number of 30-second TV commercials seen in a year by an average child is 20,000. 20,000. That our kids are being told that they need something. That they're not good enough. That if they had this, then they'd be happy. Then they'd be satisfied. Then they'd be secure. 20,000 times. Over 65-year life, that's two million, two million times we are told that we don't have enough, that we just need something to be happy, to be content, to measure up, to be worth, or that if someone else gave us this, then they really love us. Two million times. And so we wouldn't call ourselves greedy people, that I'm not some big businessman doing all this shady stuff, but we have this passive greed in our life because we're constantly being told that we don't measure up, that we just need a little bit more of all of our technology use, so we're just consuming all of this, and we're passively greedy, and we're materialistic, and we have this consumerism that's in hyperdrive. And really what it, the core of it is, idolatry. That we've put something at the center of our life that we want to then define our life, to worship, to live around. And it may not be bad stuff. It can be our marriage, our spouse, our kids, our job, our education, these are good things that we can work at and that are important. But when we put people or things at the center of our life, then we will always have an ebb, of flow, ebb and flow of joy and dissatisfaction in our life. Because people are flawed just like us, and they will let us down. The relationships will suffer, we'll go through financial issues in our economy. And if you're building your life around that, around your retirement nugget, around your new bow, around whatever it is, the thing will break the thing will fail you. The person will hurt your feelings. We will have these issues. And if we're worshiping that, if we've built our life around that, then we're just going to have this constant up and down in life. And we're not made to do that. We're made to know God and have him at the center of our life. And in him, we have security and worth and comfort and all of that tied up in our relationship with him. And so our joy then is steady and is not tied to the ebb and flow of life. And really at the core of it is greed because of the idolatry in our hearts and in our life. The third fact is this. Security from money is a lie. Security from money is a lie. Jesus addresses this in Luke chapter 12. Here's a story. Luke chapter 12 says, Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So it's implying then that he had an older brother that's not dividing the inheritance with him. And I love Jesus' reply. He says, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, so he goes off of it to make a bigger point, watch out, 
Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Jesus says it's not all that you got that defines your life. Life doesn't consist in that. Watch out against all of that. And then he tells them a parable. A parable is an earthly story. It's an illustration from stuff in our life, or in their day it was a lot of farming examples, but it's something from our life with a spiritual principle, a heavenly principle to it. So he tells them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. And so this wealthy man, he has a crop that does super well. It's like his business has a big year. It booms. He makes a bunch of money. Instead of giving it away or investing it or any of that, he stores it up for himself and says, I'm just going to take life easy. I'm a coast because now I'm secure. Now I'm good. And God says, you fool. I can take that away from you tonight. Everything that you've built, the security that you think you have from money is a lie. It could be taken away in an instant. That's what God says to him. When you're not rich towards God, when you hold on to it and build everything on that, it can be taken away. And that's really what money is. It's a false security blanket. That we think we get security, safety, comfort, our sense of worth from our money, but really it's a false security blanket. And that phrase, a security blanket or a comfort blanket, comes from little kids. Right? And if you've had kids, you've seen this, I've seen this with mine, all of my kids have some little blanket or a teddy bear that they carry around all the time and they need it to fall asleep. And when you can't find it, it's like, good Lord, where is this thing? This child needs to fall asleep, right? And so with my, Stella, my oldest, she has a little lion, stuffed animal, a little lion, and she calls it Teddy. I don't know why. It's a lion. My children will be so confused as they age. She has a little Teddy that's a lion. She's always got to have it. And then Judah, my son, he's got a little lamb, so it's lammy. And then Nora, my, my youngest, has a pink teddy bear and a pink blanket. It was her mom, so it's super cute. Second generation, little comfort blanket. But the thing is, she went through a phase where she had to have a bunch of other stuff too, like this llama stuffed animal, a brown bear book, her bottle. And so like going to bed was a process. It'd be like, get you in bed. Where's my teddy? Oh, I found it, you know? And there was my bottle, my brown bear book, which we had like two or three copies of. Praise the Lord. <laughs> So I'm like finding one, like, here you go. I'm like, oh, it's in the car or whatever, right? You've been there. But the thing is, these, these trinkets, these things that our kids want to be able to feel comfortable and safe and secure and go to sleep, don't really provide that for them. We know this. This little blanket is not really going to keep my daughter warm. Her giant comforter is. Our warm house, the heat will keep her warm in winter. It's not going to keep her dry. The, the roof over her head, our house will keep her dry, will keep her safe. The electricity will light the house. The food on the table given to her will feed her, right? This little trinket, this little thing is not really her security in life. She just thinks it is. And it can be taken away and it can be given. But I, as her father and her mother with me, know that her needs are really being met by us, which in turn we get it from God. But that's how we think of money and we think of these things that we build in life, that we finally got the big house, we got a new boat, or we got whatever it is, the, the job that we're going to make a whole lot more money. It's this false sense of security that can be taken away. And as I said before, we were created to be in a garden with God. And in that garden, all of those needs were met. That we had worth because we were in relationship with our creator God that is our heavenly father, that we are his son, his daughter. And so because of that, we have great immense worth that we do measure up, that we do matter because of that relationship with our Heavenly Father. And we were safe in the garden. And it's not a garden like the thing in your backyard. It's the, the, it's the ultimate form of creation, this beauty of what God has created. And we had shelter, we had security, we had food provided for us. All of that in that original relationship with God and everything is broken in life and humanity is just trying to get back to that. And so we chase money because we think it's going to give us security, comfort, and worth. And so that's our little blanket we got to have, that we got to build. But God's like, man, that can be taken away. I can give you that and I can take it away because I know that it's the house I put over you, the food I give you, you as my child that really gives you worth. You understand? Money's just a false security. And that's what Jesus is saying. This rich guy put all of his worth 
everything and what he had, and he's going to take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. God's like, you fool. That can be taken away. Security from money is a lie. So as I conclude and wrap up, I'll end with three quick application points, things that you can implement today, this week, to work on the greed, the idolatry, really, in your life. And the first is this. Dethrone the idols and learn to be content. Notice these are active, right? Because of this passive greed that we have in our life, we need to actively then dethrone the idols as if the idol is sitting on the throne of our life, the king of our life that we're living around. We need to kick that idol off of there and put God in his rightful place in our life. We need to learn to be content, teach ourselves to be content. And it's the little things when you catch yourself like, oh yeah, it'd be really nice to have that. And you start dreaming about it. You start going on Zillow. Mm, that would be nice, right? And then all of a sudden, we're not content with what we do have. We've got to catch ourselves and watch for that. We have to learn to be content with what we have and enjoy the blessings that God has given us. And some of us just need to repent of our greed. That's the second thing. Just own it. Call it out. Repentance is confessing, is realizing what you've done wrong and turning from it and turning back to God. And that's what we need to do. We've been greedy and we realize it and we just need to confess that, turn from it and turn back to God. And then just real practically, give something up this week. Give something up. Maybe give something away or don't buy that specialty coffee every day that you don't really need. Give something up. Give something away. Show that it doesn't control your life, that it's not a little idol that you have to have. Give it up and give it away. Help someone else in need. Be a generous person because that's really the opposite of greed. This rich man built up all this stuff and held on to it. He wasn't generous with others. He held on to it for himself. The opposite of greed is to be generous and to give things away to others. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day that we as your people can gather in your name, or that we sing your praises and that we learn about you. God, help us to dethrone the idols in our life, to be content where you've placed us, to be satisfied, to have our sense of security, comfort, and worth in our relationship with you, Lord to not use the things that you've blessed us with in this life as our idols, things that we live for and worship, but instead use them in a way that we appreciate them and we give glory and worship to you as our Father that has given us everything in life. Lord, we thank you for the very breath we are breathing now. Lord, we thank you for the country you've placed us in, the town you've placed us in, the family you've placed us in. Lord, we just say thank you and we sing your praises. God, help us to be generous with the time, the money, and the resources you've blessed us with, God. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.